everyone, and welcome to our first webinar of a new season of interviews with leaders and interesting persons uh, in the Hymn Society in the United States and Canada. My name is Mike McMahon, and I'm the Executive Director. Um, it's my pleasure today to be uh, having a conversation with Paul Westermeyer. Uh, Paul is certainly well known to anyone who's involved in church music at a high level in the United States. Uh, he's a scholar, a practitioner, an author, a teacher, and a mentor to many of us who have been in this field for a long time. Uh, Paul most recently was director of the church music program at uh, uh, Luther Seminary in, in Minnesota, uh, but he's also the author of several well-known books that uh, have been very influential uh, for those of us who embraced the vocation of church music. Uh, Paul also has served the Hymn Society and been involved for a long time. He served as editor of the Hymn and as president of the Hymn Society at one time, and he is also a fellow of the Hymn Society. So it's great to be with you, Paul, and uh, looking forward to our time together today. So, Paul, um, I wonder if uh, we could get started by talking a little bit about your early life and how you got in interested in uh, church music and ministry to start with. Well, I was um, born in Cincinnati, Ohio. I was a member of an evangelical and reformed church in downtown Cincinnati, Salem, with a high steeple and um, a very singing congregation. And um, I just assumed that was the norm that kind of a singing congregation, but I discovered it was not always the norm. Um, and um, as I got older, I got interested uh, specifically in the church's song, but when I was about nine years old, I felt called to uh, become a minister, a pastor. So I was set, I set out to study theology, but I was always studying music along with it at the same time, and um, that has continued throughout my life. Uh, it turned out that I postponed ordination. Uh, well, let, let, let me say, this is getting beyond your initial question, Mike. <laughs> Uh, but yeah. I'm, what happened was I went to Elmhurst College, and I was going to major in, what, philosophy or sociology or history or something else, as I was told by all the um, pastors and musicians. If you're going to be a pastor, then what you need to do is study theology. Well, I wound up taking all the music courses, <laughs> and it wound up as the, the uh, as a music major. I had a roommate who said to me, Westermeyer, why don't you give it up and just major in music, which is what I did. I had a prof at Elmhurst College, uh, T. Howard Krieger, who was a committed churchman and also a fine, fine theory teacher. I had worked through the hymnal or denominational hymnal at home uh, the whole thing, piece by piece, chord by chord, bass to soprano, and I had learned how to read music um, that way and could so, see chord. So you're you're back in Cincinnati now, right? I mean, this is well. Early. That's that's what that's what led me to to get to Elmhurst College. Uh -huh. and now my professor, I had a professor who explained that all to us. I, I understood, began to understand how these chords all fit together. And then I decided I should um, do the Master of Sacred Music program at Union Seminary. <laughs> so I wound up um, starting with the summer at Union Seminary, then going to Lancaster Seminary and back and forth and back and forth until I finished doing the, um, I finished the BD, which would now be an MDiv in three years. And then one more year was required to finish the MSM, and I did that. And rather than be ordained at that point, I became a church musician. 
I... So but before you before you go on, Paul, I was wondering, d- d- was your family into the into church also? Yes, um, my dad was an electrical engineer, but he was um, he sang in the 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 the, the um, Evangelical Reform Choir, the E and R Choir in Cincinnati. And uh, I went and sat at those rehearsals with him. Uh, my mother was a piano teacher, and then my whole family was were members of the uh, the church, and um, I mean extended family as well as uh, my immediate family. And um, they all sang. Um, they were all they weren't professional musicians. But they all sang, and um, there was a splendid organist who came while I was in, well, I was, I guess, in high school or even before, and I plagued him to take organ lessons. Um, very young guy, he wasn't much older than I was, but he played extremely well. And so, yeah, through the whole experience in my home church, I had... Um, a considerable, a considerable exposure to music and hymnody, and my I should also say my dad taught a Sunday morning course, um, a, a Sunday school course for adults while every, while the kids were in Sunday school, and he um, had used the hymnal companion, Hoistler's companion to the ENR hymnal and learned about every hymn in the book uh, that way in other ways. And he taught a chorus about hymns. So yes, my life was full of the possibilities of learning about music and hymnody and actually experiencing it. And I just say how interesting it is that your you, your father was teaching out of a hymnal companion, and you went on what later on to author uh, hymnal companions, huh? Right. Well, yeah. The, not only the hymnal companion, but then uh, Jennifer Baker Trinity, who's a member of our joined our church and works in Logsburg Fortress, said to me one day, uh, "Paul, I want to talk to you. Come over to the library and let's have the conversation." And so we sat down in the library, and she said. Would you write the hymnal companion to All Creation Sings, which is the supplement to um, the hymnal companion? And I said, said, sure. And I must say that those two books took a long time. I mean, I had a sabbatical for the for uh, ELW, but working, I had I sort of figured out a schedule how much I could do in any one day or any one week, and sometimes uh, the schedule got extended. But um, I learned an awful lot in the process and uh, learned a lot from other hymnal companions and from people like you, Mike, and others who uh, in the hymn society and so on who, who, who um, know about these things. There are so many details to take into account, as well as the overall shape and sense of what the what we're doing when we sing hymns so just going back to your earlier life were you involved as a young person in leading congregational song like at your home church (laughs) well i should say explain this my mother was a pianist she also happened to play the organ and in the summertime when our organist could not be there He asked her to play. So one summer, when she was going to play, I had gotten begun to get interested in the organ, and I had found uh, instruction in other books around our church. And so I bugged her and bugged her and bugged her to let me play in her place. She was not Mm -hmm. very sure this was a great idea, but she finally conceded. And so for, I'm not sure how long, six weeks, two months or something like that, I practiced at church for, I I found out what the hymns were going to be and everything that was going to be sung that morning. 
and found some simple prelude and offertory and postlude or something like that. And I just practiced and practiced and practiced that every time I could get down to the church. But I didn't, well, I should also say then for one year, while I was still in high school, I was visiting, I, I was going to every church I could possibly find across denominations. Uh, as soon as I could drive, I drove, but before that, I walked to them. And uh, there was a Presbyterian church in downtown Cincinnati that somehow I discovered needed a musician. So for a while in that Presbyterian church, I played. I'm not even sure where that is anymore, but I did that. And then also, in high school, I organized a choir for a veterans hospital. The organist I was talking about at our church was John Weisrock, and he was playing for a chapel services in this veterans hospital, and I discovered that. And I had gotten especially interested in choral conducting. I read Max Rudolph's book from straight to start to finish, and my dad um, blew up all the diagrams and put them on our wall, and I traced them all and learned about choral conducting and asked choral conductors what was going on. And I organized a choir from my high school uh, choir students, my friends, and we sang at that those services. So I led in that sense, but I didn't have any what full time extended full time position in high school. But I hmm. did those things. But you really got into it. Uh, it sounds like I mean internally, it sounds like you were like gung ho. Well, you know, I was studying. I, I also discovered that well, it was fourth grade or something like that, like that in the, the Cincinnati public schools, they had a program that you could study violin. Um, Mr. Graining, as I, I'm not sure exactly how his name was spelled. We, we said Graining, but I suspect it was G-R-A, umlaut, N-I-N-G. I'm not sure uh, if that was right. But in any case, he was a violinist from the Philadelphia Orchestra who was teaching in the public schools. And I could study without paying for anything, just get free lessons. And so I rented a violin from Willis Music Company and began to study. And then I actually switched at one point to studying violin at the um, Let's see, it was in the Conservatory of Music. The Conservatory and the College of Music were two separate components in, in Cincinnati. They uh, have since joined and joined the University of Cincinnati. But I, was, I, I studied with Ronald Kaneska, who was a member of the uh, Cincinnati Orchestra at the Conservatory. And I walked across town from our house to the Conservatory for lessons which was, I don't know, several miles back and forth. And I remember thinking on those trips back and forth while I was walking and carrying my fiddle under my arm, what in the world is all this about? How does the singing of the church and the music of the church and the music of orchestras and violins and oboes and trumpets and so on, how in the world does that all fit together? I should. This is this is much much later. Yesterday, as a matter of fact, um, um, Michael Barone, who does Pipe Dreams, yeah, had a 40th anniversary celebration at I Bethel University, yeah. <laughs> and they did. Or they somehow they I'm going to talk to a couple people about how they assembled this orchestra. They just it must have been a pickup orchestra, I assume. NPR uh, paid for that or something like that. I don't know, but in any case, they had this fine orchestra and played orchestra pieces with organ. Michael Barone actually played one of them. Wow. Three other people. I mean, he, his was a less complicated one. Though some of them were quite, uh, uh, Aaron, Aaron David, or David Aaron Miller, whichever way his name is, um, 
and Brenda Sevchik, a very young lady, uh, played. So there, there is an illustration of some fine, fine music with the organ involved in it. And I had some inkling of that sort of stuff when I was studying the violin, but I really knew very little. But it, it generated in me an interest to find out what in the world is going on with all of this. And it set in motion after the the um, master of sacred music in the the um, uh, um, at BD, and then having a full time job in a church, it set in motion all kinds of thoughts about these things, and then finally drove me when I was teaching in Elmhurst College to figure out how I could study this. Um, Francis Williamson, a friend of mine, a Methodist or a musician, organist, whom I met when I went to seminary, was um, very thoughtful about this. And we had extended conversations from the moment I went to seminary. The president realized we were both interested and he put us together. And at one point, much later, when I was teaching at Elmer's College and he knew I was trying to figure this out, he said, why don't you go talk to Joe Sittler at the University of Chicago, which I did. And that wound up generating a doctorate at the University of Chicago, Sittler. After I got there, Sittler retired. <laughs> of course. But then I, I had a course with Martin Marty and I discovered here is a person who could understand my questions and help me figure them out. And did he ever? And then James Gustafson was the theological reader that I needed a musical reader. And I was going to, how, how will I figure this out? Well, the University of Chicago allowed me or allowed anybody to find a reader outside the, the university. So I went to Marty one day and I said, Dr. Marty, would it be okay if I ask Carl Schock to be the musical uh, reader? He said, sure. So I went and went to um, Concordia. It was Concordia College at the time. And I talked to him and uh, asked um, a bunch of questions, and he had, had similar questions. So we sat in the classroom and talked to him, but he became a very fine reader. And those three people, Marty and Sittler and um, Schalk, helped me very much think through the problems. And that was my dissertation then was, uh, let's see, uh, Theology and Cultic Song in the German Reformed and Lutheran Churches of Pennsylvania, 1830 to 1900. So it was a 19th study of the, or 19th century study of the liturgical movement in the Reformed Church and somewhat in the Lutheran Church and comparing those two things. Hmm. That's an extended answer to your question, Mike. Sorry about that. No, I, that's quite all right. It's very, it's really interesting. And it, it sort of then, I guess, sort of propelled you into a career where you've done music and you've done pastoring and you've done teaching uh can you say a little bit about the interaction of all those yeah well um you know that's right it um i took the job at um uh a lutheran church in silver spring when i finished the master of sacred music program the degree after i finished at seminary and i was there for two years in a large church outside in Silver Spring, Maryland, right outside of Washington, D.C. And while I was there, I got a call from my former music teacher, Howard Krieger, who said, um, would you be willing to come here and teach? And I thought, whoa, really? And he invited me to come, and we had lunch and, I, and so on. And the, the, they needed um, an organ professor and teacher of church music. It, it's Elmer's College is part of the evangelical piece of the evangelical Reformed Church. It's a Lutheran, Lutheran 
portion of the E and R UCC. And so I, we talked about it, and, he, and then he and they, whoever was on this committee, decided to uh, call me. And so I went there and um, taught a course in church music. And as soon as I possibly could, I got a real organist. I mean, I can play the organ and I can play a decent service, but I, I, can, I, can, I can teach the organ relatively well. But I wanted somebody who was really good at it. First of all, an organist, not first of all, somebody who's asking all these questions. And Naomi Rowley was in town. So she came and taught the organ. And um, I taught this course in church music. Okay, I'm teaching this course in church music, and I put on closed reserves in the library a whole bunch of books. So the students in the class were constantly going to the library, uh, figuring out how, would, how they would share these resources, because obviously the point to, uh, to uh, the point was to read them at certain times in the semester as, as the syllabus, syllabus progressed. And they continually said to me, Dr. Westermeyer, why don't you give us one book, all of this stuff between two covers? And I said, you know, I would like to do that, but there's no such book. And they said to me, well, write one. <laughs> So that led that, that led to two kinds of books. First of all, the role of the church musician. Um, that was the first one. But then the second one that was requested was um, something about that lay behind all of that. And so that's what led to Te Deum, uh, the church in music. Um, so yeah, again, um, a long answer to your question. Yes, I've propelled, been propelled to figure this out um, for my whole life and to um, teach about it. I'm very grateful that there were positions that actually would um, be interested in this. Uh, mm -hmm. They have tended to evaporate, as uh, you may know. Um, I can add to that too, if you would like, but um, at the moment, let it suffice to say that um, I am great, deeply grateful. And so are my, I must say, so are my students. Not, my students are were grateful, not only to me, but for the opportunity to be able to study this, these subjects, because the, the, the um, well, I should say this as well. When I was growing up as a kid, in the church and starting to ask these questions. The musicians and the pastors both told me, Paul, music is the war department. That's where you fight. And I discovered that that was true, that musicians and pastors sometimes were at loggerheads. However, I also discovered that there were really musicians and pastors who talked to each other. I mean, and I say that not so facetiously, but actually talked to each other because in some cases they simply stopped talking, would not do it. Right. And um, so the um, that that whole experience began to propel me to figure things out and also to discover that there were books written about this. I discovered Eric Routley, for example, and um, I, that pretty much I did that kind of thing on my own because the, the pastors and musicians that I knew uh, when I was growing up didn't seem to think there was any kind of material like this. The musicians were taught to practice music the the pastors were taught to study theology and never the twain would meet. And I kept asking, aren't these things related? And then I also discovered they're not only related, those two disciplines, but liturgiology is also related. And so you've got to figure the whole thing out together. Um, 
And as I say, there are wonderful oases where this happens, but there are some also, what shall I say, there are horror stories, and all of us know about them. Well, before you get to the horror story part, I was wondering if you could say a little bit about how you put all of that into practice at Luther Seminary, the program that you had there, and um, the way that th- those, you know, theology and music and liturgiology um, could interact and uh, sort of create, um, you know, opportunities for church musicians to embrace a, a vocation, not just a job. Well, that's an interesting issue. Um, when I was called to um, Luther Seminary, it was John Ferguson and David Teedy who had set this in motion. John Ferguson was teaching at um, St. Olaf College and somehow he discovered about me, he must have read something that I wrote. And he went and talked to David Teedy. And the two of them figured out somehow the possibility of my coming and uh, teaching a course in church music. Now, these are um, future pastors that they're talking about. But then in the process of this, I don't know if it was before I began to interview or after, or, I mean, or or much earlier or much or, or a little bit later, but anyway, at some point in the interview process, they said to me, are you willing to think about doing a program in theology and music that would join together Luther Seminary and St. Olaf College? And I thought, sure, I'm quite willing to do this, but this is not the simplest thing in the world. That's about 50 miles apart. And um, so I... I said, uh, well, they said, we'll probably only have one one student per year, uh, one one per person or so per year. Well, <laughs> I came, and there were more than that already that wanted, without knowing that such a thing was going to happen. There were there was one person particularly, but several of them, who were trying to figure out how they can do this kind of study. Somehow, and we're talking with Luther Seminary, Luther Seminary about it. So we began the program and set it up with St. Olaf College. And um, the students, well, the few who were there multiplied much beyond what they expected. And so St. Olaf had to set a limit. We can't take more than three students per year. It was a two-year program, two-year Master of Sacred Music program. We cannot take more than three students per year. That meant we should have six students in residence. Well, we had, I think I I counted once, uh, for many of the years in the program, is there for, um, what, 23 years. For many of the years, we had between nine and 17 students in residence because they asked me, could they do the program slow motion, course by course by course, because they had church jobs. And I said, we have to require field work for this. And so that could serve as field work and somebody wouldn't go full time. There were some who went full time. But in those 23 years, if we had had, had one student Per, per year, what would that be? Um, 23 students or um, maybe two a year, that'd be 46. Well, we had 94 graduates. And then there are all, as I discovered when I was at Elmhurst, as well as at Luther Seminary, there are always some students, this, this mystifies me, but there are always some students who have everything done for a degree, except for one little detail. And for those students, as the the chair at the music, I finally became chair at Elmhurst, and as the chair there, and as the head of the Master of Sacred Music program at Luther, again and again, for those people, I would beg them, look, just take this one test. 
or do this one thing. And there, there I've discovered this is not only Elmhurst and Luther Seminary. This seems to be across the board problem. There's always some person or persons who don't finish. <laughs> I mean, they have virtually everything done. So we have 94 officially, but I have a list on my wall with a few other people on some years that had basically finished everything. So it's really a little bit more than that. I don't know if it's 97 or I don't know, something like that. Anyway, uh, that's again, a long answer to your question, Mike. I hope I haven't rambled too much here. No, it's interesting because I think there are a lot of people who are well-formed in academic programs who never finish, but are just as well-formed as those who actually finish. Right. I mean, it's oh, that that's exactly right. That's yeah. exactly right. Yeah, that's really interesting. And they, and they seem not to care about the degree. And I always tell them, well, you know, at some point you're going to be sorry you didn't finish this. And often I have uh, discovered somebody who's told me, well, Dr. Westmore, you were right. And I wish I would have done what you said. Right. I think uh, regret uh, does set in for, for a lot of people. I, I, I'd like to turn, if you don't mind, but before we do turn, I do want to say to the people who are watching, if you have a question or a comment that you'd like to make, uh, you can put it in the chat and I'll try to incorporate as much as I can as, as we as we move forward. Um, but I'd like to turn to the Hymn Society, if you don't mind, and uh, ask you a little bit about how you got involved in the Hymn Society and what it was like when you first uh, started going. Well, you know, I don't know how it was that I discovered the Hymn Society, but I think the first conference I went to was 1977. I think that's right. I, I can't find out exactly. And um, I, th I think it was in Chicago, as a matter of fact. I think that's right. In any case, when I went to the Hymn Society, I was um, shocked, pleasantly shocked. I had discovered that professional societies, and I assume this was another professional society, profess professional societies tended to be concerned about one-upmanship. How I can prove to you that I'm better than you are, and somebody else is proving to somebody else that he or she is better than that person, et cetera. And it was, it's, it's all, always felt like one-upmanship. When I came to the Hymn Society, I had this strange experience that that was not what was going on at all. This was a society where people actually learn from one another. <laughs> they, they took seriously what other people were doing and tried to find out about it. So that was my experience in, in um, joining the Hymn Society, and I was grateful for it all the time. And then I think, um, this may be not right exactly, but I think in 1984, we actually had a conference at Elmhurst College when I was teaching at Elmhurst College. And I've tied, I have attended, I think, every one of the Hymn Society meetings from 1977 till COVID. And then at COVID, obviously, got tripped up. And then I didn't go to Montreal because by that time I had decided, Westermeyer, you have no business going to transcontinental conferences anymore. Stop. Forget it. Don't do it. It was very painful not to be able to do that. But I thought as an octogenarian, that probably is right. I can still sit at my desk and do things, but I'm not sure I should be traveling. I'm always um, somewhat, um, what shall I say, um, a little bit uh, uh, accused uh, about my decision from Heinrich Schutz. Because Heinrich Schutz, when he was an octogenarian, wrote the St. Matthew Passion. But then I say to myself, <laughs> Westermeyer, you can sit at your desk and you can do that kind of stuff. You don't have to go to conferences. So <laughs> it's a mixed bag, but I do, I very much miss going to um, the meetings. But the problem is with, with hearing in large spaces, for example, it's not only traveling and staying in hotel rooms and stuff, but 
It's hearing in large spaces, which is incredibly frustrating. Uh, my son the other day said to me, Dad, would you like to go to an open rehearsal of Contus? Contus is this small group of singers that was organized on the Center Love campus, and he's on the board. And I said, sure. So we went to the, there's a Presbyterian church in town where they rehearse, and in the little chapel there, not a very big one, they rehearse, and then they sit around in a circle, and they say things. Well, I can't hear exactly what's being said, and that is extremely frustrating. I can still read things. I can, As I say, I can still work at my desk, but I, I know I'm not the only octogenarian in this kind of shape. I have a, a seminary classmate who says, getting old ain't for sissies. <laughs> well, you know, we have another octogenarian in the hymn society who let us know that there was a problem, a hearing problem, and we did invest in a um, a hearing assist uh, system. Uh, so, you know, if, if you do decide to come, you no, know, we have we have this for you. Emily Emily Brink told me about that too, um, but not every building is equipped with it. Mount Olive, no. Church, the Mount Olive Church here in town is. My church is not. So you're right, but so it's spotty, and you're you're so, right. So we we have our own that we bring with us, and uh, so everything that happens in the plenary space uh, is uh, you know is available to people with the hearing assist system. So okay, I have to remember that, Mike. <laughs> so I'm trying to entice you back, Paul. <laughs> well, I, I I love to be there. Yeah, there are people making comments, you know, about how how much they miss you at these conferences. So, yeah, well, I, well, I think you. Sam Young, I think, was going till he was ninety four, right? Something he, like that. He was. I, I think he was ninety six, actually. And you know, he um, and, and I, I actually, I don't know if you were aware of this or anybody else uh, who's watching is aware of this, but Sam Young was scheduled for today's interview. Oh. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and then he he went and, and he, when he, when when he uh, when he agreed to it, he said, I said, well, you know, which which one would you like to have I said, I'll take September. That's the earliest. And he said, I, I, I you know, I, I don't even buy green bananas. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, uh, I was sorry that he he didn't make it to the to the interview. But uh, but uh, anyway, he's he's certainly another giant in our in our field. Uh, I, I want to talk to you about the hymn. You know, uh, later in the year, we're going to have an interview with Robin Knowles Wallace, who holds the record now for longest uh, tenure as editor of the hymn. She, it will have been 11 years for her. But um, I'm wondering if you, what was that like for you to be the editor of the hymn? Well, it was absolutely delightful, but it, it took, um, I was teaching at Elmhurst College and we were living at Ville Park at the time. And so um, I was asked to be the editor of the hymn, and it meant that I would receive all these submissions and had to work through them, edit them, and make decisions about them. Um, and that actually turned out to be quite... Um, quite positive. I mean, the, the, the things that were said were really quite good, and I learned a lot. But I obviously could not set this whole thing up. But there was a guy in town whom I learned about who did what I learned was called key lining. So he would come to my house and help set up um, the hymn. And um, it was, uh, as in all the experiences with the Hymn Society, it was uh, a delightful uh, a time. I mean, it was a lot of work, um, but, but nonetheless, I, I learned a lot in the process as I do whenever I read the hymn. And I was, um, grateful for being able to do it and as usual when I've done things like that all I say at the end well I hope I've been helpful <laughs> uh -huh. but I, I'm, I'm really interested to hear you say all this because um, in the comments uh, 
we we just heard from Carl Bear, who is the incoming editor of the hymn. So you you know if you have any advice for him, I'm sure he'd be grateful for it. Best wishes, Carl. Um, <laughs> thank you, and I expect you obviously will do a fine job. But it is not a little thing. I mean, it 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 takes considerable time and effort. Well spent. It was worth doing. Very much worth doing. Yeah. Cool. Now, you also served as president of the Hymn Society, and so I, I'm guessing you have some insight about, you know, what, what is it that makes the Hymn Society special, aside from the collegial aspect you talked about before, and, you know, what's the contribution that it's making to the uh, to the church? Well, you know, I've tried to think about this, Mike, and if you ask me about the tales, maybe just because of my age, I'm not sure I can tell you the tales, but I can tell you that working with the people in the hymn society in that capacity was delightful as well. It was not just sort of sit down and just do whatever you please and don't think about it. No, it was thinking about it, but it was thinking about things collegially. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, let me also say this. I think... I've come to think this more and more, that our hymnals represent that collegial sense of the church that comes through in its singing. That is to say, at any one given moment, there are probably zillions of hymns out there that could be used. And they often get put together in any given hymnal. So any given hymnal will have a bunch of hymns, and then it turns out that there are some of them that will be used less than others. And that's not simply a popularity contest, because it's also related to what happened in the previous generation, and the previous generation, going all the way back to Ambrose, or Luther, or Gerhard, or wherever you want to go, uh, the, the 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 hymns of the church, the song of the church, takes into account this check and balance system across 20 centuries. And um, that that is profoundly countercultural. I mean, the culture's thing is that we're supposed to be in warring tribes and shoot each other and kill each other and hate each other. And the, the, the message of the church, of course, is that, no, uh, yes, you will do bad stuff, but you are forgiven, and the responsibility is to live for the glory of God and the good of your neighbor. And that, it seems to me, is always what hymn that he finally does, not at any one moment exactly. I may write a hymn or a tune or something that's ingrown and not very much useful, but that will be... Um, what shall I say, um, contextualized by the larger church and across the, but that's interesting also that in spite of our denominational divisions, our hymnals tend to be ecumenical, cross-denominational. We have hymns from various groups that we all sing. Uh, that's not surprising. That's not to say that we don't emphasize ones that come from our particular uh, tradition or heritage, now, that's okay too. Um, but nonetheless, there is this this check and balance thing that goes across generations for the church's hymn, that he, both in the text and in the music. And the textual musical mix is also a very um, helpful one. I mean, the, the, the musical mix means that these run through time. The canvas is time. And how does that work not only for expertise or for those people who are musicians, but for normal human beings who wish to sing? And who hymnody is a kind of folk song. And we in the culture have tended to obliterate any folk song. We don't we tend not to sing together very much. The church is one of the few places that, that where that happens, and I'm always I'm 
I'm a, I, I'm a member of a church uh, not too far from my house here, a Lutheran Church of the Resurrection in Roseville. And it's not a very large church. I don't know what we, we have, I don't know, probably um, 80 to 100 people who come normally for services in the summertime when people are on vacation, it may be fewer than that, but it's something like that. And um, a choir that sings very well with a bunch of instrumentalists and a musician, one of my MSM students, as a matter of fact, who plays very well, improvises very well. And it is always such um, healing delight to sing with that congregation. And I think that's not simply what happens in my church. I've experienced that in other churches as well. Interesting. Well, certainly the, one of the themes of our conversation today has been connections. I mean, you talk about music and theology and ecumenism and collegiality and a lot, a lot, just lots and lots of connections. And uh, I think for those of us who know you, you've been a great influencer in helping us all to connect in various ways. And I, I'm grateful. Well, I hope, I hope that's true. It, I, I, it's undoubtedly true. Um, one last question I have for you, and that is, um, what would be your fondest hope for the Hymn Society in, as it moves forward? My fondest hope for the Hymn Society is that it continues to do what it does and to do it as well as possible and continues to take seriously the nature of hymn singing, what I just talked about. Mm -hmm. As long as it doesn't get off track and we learn from one another and live together in song, we're okay, and I think the Hymn Society does that. Um, the number of people who um, come to a Hymn Society conference and come away saying, oh my gosh, they sang so well. And that's not just a matter of some professional choir singing very well. There's a place for professional choirs singing well. I'm all in favor of that. As a matter of fact, I've supported it often. But there is also a place for the folk song of the church, the hymnody of the church, the liturgy of the church, which is sung, all of those things. And um, my fondest hope is that the um, hymn society continues to take that seriously. In, in whatever kinds of, I mean, it obviously lives through the the contours of a given period mm -hmm. it, it it's not unrelated it's not some airy cloud in the sky some uh, docetic phantom going off there it's um part of um, the stream of uh, the life of the church a very positive part of the stream of the life of the church and to study and sing that is my fondest hope well, thank you, Paul. Thank you for the encouragement, and thank you for all that you do. We're really uh, happy to, to hear, hear your story today. Thank you, Mike, for what you do, and thank the Hymn Society for what it does. Um, it is no small thing. Well, thanks so much. Well, everybody, um, thank you for being with us today, and I uh, hope you'll, you'll be with us as this series continues. We've got we've got eight more for, the, for this series uh, uh, during the coming months, so uh, we'll look forward to seeing you then. Thanks, everybody. Take care. Thank you.